Recent revisions of the modernist art canon have shown us that many artists and artworks of merit have been omitted from the history books. In reevaluating the criteria for success, heretofore unknowns are being uncovered who deserve as much attention as those whose names are so familiar. Michael Brenner is one such artist, a gifted American sculptor who chose a uniquely personal creative path. Born in Lithuania in 1885, Michael Brenner moved with his family to New York at the age of seven. The first stirrings of his love for sculpture developed during these early years while apprenticing to his brother, a renowned sculptor medalist and designer of the 1909 Lincoln Penny. He later attended the Art Students League, where his strength in art was soon recognized. Encouraged by his teacher, Michael Brenner moved to Paris in 1901 at the age of 16. He entered the Ecole de Beaux-Arts and later enrolled in the Academy Julian. A first prize winner in a competition during his Paris schooling, Brenner was consumed by hours of study in museums, his interest in the avant-garde, and an intense commitment to his own Paris studio. Although Brenner chose to work alone, he was sought after by the Paris avant-garde, Picasso, Brie, Rousseau, Brock, and Jay. His work was much admired by Gertrude Stein, who posed for a portrait bust and full nude figure. He collaborated with Robert Cody, and together they published the art magazine, The Soil, which served as an early outlet for Stein's writings. In the early 20s, she, uh, Gertrude Stein, commissioned my father to do a portrait of her, for which she sat, and I think the relationship went very well up until the time when the bust was perhaps close to finished. And then perhaps something happened, because that was just about the same time that my father left the Gertrude Stein circle, broke with him, if you like, and went off on his own. Exactly why Brenner chose to walk away from those who sought him is not clear. There is no doubt that Stein thought favorably of him and of his work, and as the muse of success for many Parisian artists of the day had assured his stature. It is known, however, that he disliked the hollow and theatric aspects of competition. I think about uh, the seething cauldron that Brenner found himself in in 1905, 1906. Certainly there was the uh, presence of uh, Cezanne's influence on both painters and sculptors. Uh, with the central idea being uh, not the thing seen, but the thing as being seen. Uh, this had implication for sculptors, not the thing grasped, but the thing as being grasped. What does a young person, 16, 17, 18, make of all of this? And I think he had uh, uh, a very fine sensibility uh, that I think stood him well all his life and uh, it might be characterized as his capacity to resist with subtlety what might have been expected of him. And rather than trying to be au courant, uh, he took these ideas and he acted with restrained energies all the way through. He was not given to uh, effects. To the outbreak of World War I, Brenner traveled between New York and Paris, and in a continued partnership with Robert Cody, he acted as a European buyer, introducing the work of now famous artists to Cody's Washington Square Gallery. He also began to share his life with Fanny Trins, a model who posed for him and became his wife in 1930. Two sons were born, one later dying of a childhood illness. In 1938, the Brenners settled in New York City, where they were surrounded by a family network and a small group of friends. Patronized by several influential New Yorkers, Brenner was commissioned to create the commemorative portrait of the great financier, Jacob Schiff. Yet when the statue was almost completed, Brenner broke off the nose in response to criticism from the Schiff family. 
Art, specifically sculpting and drawing the female figure, was his consuming passion, yet few works were sold during his lifetime, largely because he held such extraordinary standards for himself that he rarely allowed anything to leave his studio. At the age of 79, and in poor health, Brenner completed his final commitment a series of bas-reliefs of the Linder sisters. These delicate pieces show his work to have matured and are finer than any done by his brother and first teacher. The work of Brenner uh, really does place a demand on the observer. It's not something that uh, an observer can walk by and immediately grasp. And for that, I think uh, we owe Brenner something uh, because he he, he educates our attention without being didactic. If you look at the work of, uh, of Brenner, it, it, it's as if he, he agitates that surface, this side of finish, so that he creates a space of light between the work and the observer. And of course, the imagination lives between things. Michael Brenner died in 1969 at the age of 84, leaving numerous drawings, marble portrait busts, and a variety of uncast pieces, as well as works in public and private collections. His work is included in the Cone Collection at the Baltimore Museum of Art and in the permanent collections of the Smithsonian, the Whitney, the Hirschhorn, and the Yale Archives of American Art. Although Michael Brenner could have chosen to stand in the spotlight, he preferred a private, solitary life, and his artistic merit is to be found in the work that remains. Its depth of feeling, the level of dedication it reveals, and his unending search for the truth of the human condition. Since his death, the remaining sketches, drawings, and sculptures awaited a time when they could be given their proper due in the historical course of American art. That time has arrived.